Welcome to Casual Friday. Hi, I'm Roxanne Richardson, and this is my weekly Casual Friday podcast. In this week's podcast, I have an update on my reverse engineered sweater. I'll share my results from the dyeing experiment I did with some hand spun yarn. And I'll talk a bit about my evolving plans for my next vintage sweater project. So let's get started. If you'd like to jump right to a specific point in the video, tap or mouse over the video playback area of your screen and use the chapter titles to guide you to the starting point of the desired section. Use the gear icon to slow down or speed up playback. So I wanted to give uh, an update on the sweater that I'm reverse engineering. So this is the original sweater. This sweater was knit with a cashmere Aran weight yarn that had a chainette construction. So it's almost like mini I-cord or like a crochet chain in a way. So that's what the original yarn was, but the yarn that I'm using is wool, not cashmere. It's worsted weight, not Aran weight. So there are a few differences in, you know, gauge and the stitch counts. And so in order to match the width of these panels uh, and the general length of the cables, I had to do some modifications. One of the things that I was concerned about originally and, and trying to think through, do I want to match this or not? was that if you look at the top of the sweater, you can see the last cable crossing is right here. And so there's, there's a couple of inches or an inch and a half to two inches of straight knitting that goes up to the shoulder seams. Typically when I'm knitting with cables, I want the first crossing to be right after the ribbing and the last crossing to be right before. I tried to, I tried to make this uh, vertical symmetry and I plan for that. So I, I might adjust my plan for how long the body is going to be um, based on making sure that I can get that, that symmetry. So this sweater didn't, does not start with a crossing right above the ribbing. It starts with a little bit of straightaway and it has that straightaway up here. So it is vertically symmetrical. But I did want to start with a cable crossing right after the ribbing on mine. And I had to think a long time about, well, what do I want to do when I get up here? Do I want to do my vertical symmetry or do I want to match this? And originally I thought, well, I'm going to match this because if I have those dimensions and this stretches this much, then I know if I, if I match what's going on up here, I know that everything will fit. And so that was my original plan. But what I didn't expect, and looking back, it probably doesn't completely surprise me, but it did take me a little bit by surprise, is that the effect that gravity has on this sweater is different from the effect gravity has on my version of the sweater. So my original plan was that I was going to need a cable crossing pretty close to here. Um, but then as I was measuring out my sweater next to this one on a flat surface with no gravity affecting it, I thought, oh no, I'm not going to do that. Uh, it's going to be, it's going to end up with this um, with like this and everything's going to match just like this one. So I don't have to recalculate anything. Turned out that once I compared my sweater hanging to this sweater hanging, I did need extra length and I did need an extra cable crossing uh, at the top. So let me show you what I mean. Is that better? Okay. So you can see I have this crossing right up here and what that has done is it holds the shoulders in so that it doesn't stretch out as much over the shoulders. Normally, I would want that, I would plan for that. But what that has done is it's, it's keeping these shoulders tighter at the top, which gives it good support, but it has meant that the sleeves have ended up a bit too short. So then I had to think about, well, I, I'm not completely sure how much too short they are. I'm, I have a, pr a pretty good idea they're an inch to an inch and a half too short. And so I had to think about, well, how am I going to lengthen them? There are a couple of options. One was to completely rip out the sleeve cap back down to prior to when the sleeve cap was worked, 
work it for an extra inch and a half and then do all the shaping again, what that would do is it would cause the sleeve cap to also end pretty close to a cable crossing, which means that the shape of the sleeve cap would now be different. And the shape of the sleeve cap, as I've knit it right now, fits perfectly in the armhole. Uh, the other issue would be that I would have an inch and a half or whatever of straight uh, sleeve, so the sleeve would end up being uh, as big as it needs to be lower on my arm uh, and then be that big for a long, longer amount of time than I would really like. So I was thinking about a couple of different options I have and, and because I only need an inch and a half and not three inches, which is what the length of one of these cable crossings is, what I am probably going to do is sew in the sleeve caps on both sides, sew up the majority of the sleeve seams so that I can try the sweater on and have both sleeves on there pulling an equal amount on each side. I can that will give me an idea of what the actual weight is that's being pulled on the shoulders. And then I can see how short those sleeves are and, um, and I can lengthen them. And the way that I will lengthen them is I will take the ribbing out. I will capture the first row of stockinette at the bottom here and take the ribbing out. And then I can do one of two things. I can either knit downward uh, in the other direction and bind off once it's as long as I want, or I can cast on a new cuff and knit it as long as I want and graft it to those live stitches that, that I have after I've removed the original. Normally, I would say knitting down is the way that I want to go. And that I would choose if I could match the cast on the bind off edge with the cast on edge. I chose a particular method of casting on that has a bind off that sort of matches it, but not as well as I would like. So I had planned for all of my cast on edges, um, all of my edges where there's ribbing to be cast on edges. So another option that I have is that because the cuff is going to be longer than, the, than original, originally all of the hems were all the same length, just barely an inch, and they, they don't pull in at all. Another option would be to create, to knit down and create it twice as long as I really need so that it can be a fold back cuff. So then the difference in length won't be as weird because it'll be, oh, that's a pretty common thing to do in a sleeve cup. And then there's another possibility, which is instead of doing a regular bind off that sort of matches the cast on that I have, that I do something different. And that what I would do that was different was to bind off using an I-cord bind off, which would then match the pockets. And then the sleeve and that I-cord, the red I-cord, would be very close in line with the tops of the pockets when my arms were down. So that's a possibility. So those are some things I'm thinking of doing. In the meantime, um, so I can sew those in and I can think about what I wanna do with the cuffs. Um, but in the meantime, I can start working on the button band. So the original button band here is in brioche. And when I was in the early stages of the sweater, I wasn't 100% sure that I would have enough yarn to knit a long sweater and be able to do brioche, a button band, because brioche tends to use more yarn than like ribbing would. And so I thought, well, if worse comes to worse, I can use the red yarn that I'm using for the pockets for the button band if, if, that, if I have to. It's not, not my first uh, preference, but I could do it. So I had a few suggestions from people. Some said, well, why can't you just take the old um, button band off, reuse that on the, on the sleeve there? Because they said, oh, you know, the color goes nicely with it. Well, it does, but then that adds a third color. You've got this, you know, red, and then you've got two grays. That's one problem. The second is different fiber, different yarn construction, different yarn weight, stains <laughs> along here. It's just not... Um, something that I would choose to do. And then there's also an option that some people suggested, which was to use two color brioche, uh, 
for the button band with the red being the one that would be the in the valleys. I thought it was an interesting idea but I wasn't crazy about it for this sweater because you've got cables, you've got a couple of different stitch patterns going on, you've got the red accents in there and then adding basically vertical stripes going all around the neck. I, I thought nah, I just I just doesn't I think for for the right sweater it would be a really cool effect. I just don't think this is the sweater for that. I did do some swatching. I've never done two color brioche. Brioche just hasn't been my thing. I had done one color brioche a number of times. And when I did the two color swatch, I realized, oh, okay, you're doing knit and pearl brioche. It's the fabric is flatter, it's floppier. And I, and I don't like the, the vertical striping effect. Um, it's just too, too floppy of, of fabric compared to what I can get with the single color brioche, which is substantial and would really hold up and make a nice button band. A final thing, which is the buttons that I have in mind for this sweater, I think it would have not been good with a two color brioche button band. It would have it wouldn't have worked. So that's where I am on this. I have both sleeves done. All the parts are done. I'm just going to have to lengthen the sleeves and and then do this uh, button band as well. But I'm getting close to the end on this sweater. In my last Casual Friday, I talked about a dyeing experiment that I wanted to do and I did it. So I learned a lot from the process. So I was starting with 100 grams of hand spun BFL silk blend. It's a three ply yarn that I'd made. And then I had 100 grams of 100% BFL three ply, but this was in natural colors. And so there are spots that are a little bit white and some that are darker and more solid brown. And I thought it would be really interesting to put skeins of both colors in the same dye and see what the difference was. I'll leave some links down below to the websites that helped me figure all of this out and, and understand kind of what to do. So I wanted to kind of start with a baseline understanding of the particular dyes that I have, the colors they produce and how intense they are. And so I wanted to create something like a medium color saturation, medium color, not super light, not super dark. And so the general advice was a 1% dye solution would do that. So that was my starting point. And what that means is that for every 100 grams of wool that you want to dye, you'd have one gram of dye powder. But you have to create a, a solution. You have to dissolve the dye and for these small quantities. So what you can do is because 100 milliliters of water weighs 100 grams, you can create a dye, a 1% dye solution where for every gram of dye powder, you put enough water to create 100 milliliters of fluid. So what I did was I created five jars of 1% dye solution. Uh, I did 300 milliliters worth so that I'd have extra and I could continue doing experiments and not have to go through that whole process of making dye solution up. So if 100 milliliters of this dye solution can dye 100 grams of wool, and I was only going to be dyeing two 20 gram skeins in each of the jar or 40 grams, then I would only need 40 milliliters of the dye solution in my dye bath. I, I used these quart sized jars and I was going to have 40 grams of wool. And I read that there was a recommendation for just the amount of liquid that you need um, for the dye to be able to move around in the bath that you'd need uh, 20 milliliters of water for every gram. So I had 40 grams of wool, so I would need 800 milliliters of, of liquid in here. So these quart sized jars have these very approximate markings on here for 800 milliliters. So I just filled it up to the 800 milliliter line. I put my 40 milliliters of dye in here, stirred it up, and then uh, that's what I used as a dye bath. So I had five colors. I had yellow, red, blue, violet, and magenta. And I did the 1% the dye solution for every one of them except for the violet. The violet was very intense. 
So instead of putting 40 milliliters in here for the 40 grams, I put 30 milliliters in and that works out to then being a 0.75% dye bath rather than the 1%. And that worked out fine. I didn't want the color to be so dark and intense that you couldn't really tell the difference between the cream uh, BFL silk and then the natural color yarn that got uh, over dyed basically. So I took some video while I was doing the dyeing process. So here are the first three quart jars with the 800 milliliters of water and I'm about to put the dye solution into each of those three jars. So I started with the yellow, the red, and the blue, and I did those first. And here you can see them in the pot. I could only fit, I could have fit four in the pot, but I had five, so I split them up three and two. And so these have been simmering for a while, um, and I had added the vinegar, which is what binds the dye to uh, the yarn. And while that was cooling for a little bit, I did, I mixed up the magenta and the violet. You can see just how dark that violet water is with just 30 milliliters of the dye solution in it compared to the magenta on the right. Once they were out of the canning pot, I could put them on our back porch to cool off and I just put lids on them so nothing would spill or fall into them. And then I let them sit uh, for the rest of the evening and until the dye had exhausted. So let's go to the overhead and I will show you the results because they're fascinating. So just as a reference, these are the two original colors. Uh, here is the yellow, so it's a very bright yellow. And then here is the yellow that was dyed uh, over the natural colors. It's almost a, a kind of a greeny color. My friend Celeste, who's done a lot of dyeing and spinning, said that these kind of natural colors have like a blue undertone to them. So that's um, why you'd end up with something that looks green. So that was the yellow. Now I love red, so I was really interested in the red and I was surprised at kind of how orangey and light this color red was. I thought it would be more intense, but it wasn't. Um, and then, but here is the result. I, I love this one. Uh, a lot. I just, it's so much more interesting. The colors are the depth of color and the, the natural uh, variegation that you see, the tonal uh, qualities of the yarn are just so much more interesting in this. So this is the blue and I would actually say this is the dye bath that exhausted during the process and it's the one dye that is the least consistently colored throughout, which I thought was kind of interesting. And then this is the, the other version, which I, I really like quite a lot. The magenta is, I would call this like hot pink. <laughs> this is like such a bright hot pink. I was expecting something a little darker and this is almost more like a fuchsia. Um, and then this is the, the result of the, the natural colors getting uh, dyed over. So I, again, I really like this one. These colors, um, they almost remind me of like synthetic yarn colors that you'd see, you know, in acrylic yarn or something. And yet it's, it, and I don't know if part of that might be the, a little, the amount of silk that's in here, if that kind of lightens it or sheen, causes a different sheen to it than, uh, than what you would see in the other one. And then here is the violet. So again, this is the one where I only used 30 milliliters. So you can imagine how dark this would have been if I'd used all 40 milliliters. And you know, there's just not as much of a difference. I mean, there certainly is a difference, but um, the difference between these two colors is is less than say the difference between these two, it, to my eye anyway. So I'm glad that I stuck with the, the three milliliters of this so that I could uh, actually, you know, see a real difference between the two colors. So this was a super fun experiment and one that I really enjoyed thoroughly. Now, a couple of people had mentioned when I mentioned I was gonna do this experiment, a couple of people mentioned that Brooklyn Tweed has a line of yarns called Tones. And what that, those yarns are is that when they have the unspun fiber, they dye some of it a, a light gray and some of it a medium gray. So they're dyeing the fleece 
and then when it gets combed it becomes kind of a heathered um, yarn and then once they've spun that into yarn then they'll dye the two different colored yarns together and so you get you get two types of, of tonal yarns rather than something that's so completely solid like this and then something that's more tonal like that um, but they work together so um, that was kind of an that's kind of an interesting thing if you're interested in this kind of effect that's created by starting with a base color um, they're not starting with a natural uh, wool color they're starting with something that they dye but they dye it in the wool and then once it's turned into yarn then they that's when they add the color so before I even did this particular experiment I had some experiments in my mind that I wanted to do I, I wanted to learn how to do this dye solution I wanted to to you know kind of see the whole process how can I do small quantities and quart size jars I wanted to kind of work all of that out and then I have some other experiments that I want to do that have to do uh, with spinning fiber and dyeing um, things at different points um, dye it in the wool dye it in the yarn and then dyeing it in the fabric and and comparing those results I also want to do some experiments where if I'm mixing colors for dyeing like if I wanted to make an orange or something and I had um, yellow and red let's say I had 80% yellow and 20% red uh, to make an orange what would that yarn look like if I dyed it in that dye, that, that mixture, versus what would happen if I took some unspun fiber, divided it up so that I had 80% and 20% and dyed the 80% yellow and the 20% red and then carded it together. I have done some blending of fibers that way and, I, and it produces a more heathered result and I think that it's probably going to be prettier. Um, but after the other thing that that I have looked at is like oh here's another thing that could be interesting is to take a natural like colored wool however dark it is or light it is silver brown whatever and do some blending with different quantities of white to create different base levels using natural colors and then dyeing them all in the same dye bath to see what kind of gradient you get with that. Um, so those are some interesting things that I thought of after doing this experiment. So I'm really happy with this experiment. Some of you may be wondering, what are you going to make with this yarn? And I have absolutely uh, nothing in mind. Uh, it's not that I can't think of things that I could knit uh, with these yarns. It's I can't think of anything that I'd want to knit that would be interesting to knit. Um, I tend to want the, that my knitting projects to be really interesting and based on techniques and construction and stitch patterns and so I start at that end rather than starting from the yarn end typically. Uh, so I I don't have anything in plan and this whole process was you know a whole a learning thing it's getting better at spinning uh, learning something about dyeing and the effects of things so I got what I wanted out of this if I ever think of something that I want to knit with this then then I will do that at, the, at, at that time but at this moment I don't really have any uh, plans for the these particular yards except to use them as reference in some way now that I'm approaching the end of my reverse engineered sweater, I'm thinking about my next sweater project. So at this point in my long-term project to knit a sweater from each decade from the 1890s to the 1990s, I have knit from the 1890s to the 1960s. So my next project will be a 1970s sweater. And I'm using one that is from Elizabeth Zimmerman and it uses her EPS or Elizabeth percentage system. It's more of a, a guideline for designing your own sweater than it is an actual pattern. And so this is what appealed to me about this. So she uh, produced a few approaches for knitting a stranded colorwork sweater with steaks in it. So that's when you knit the sweater, the body of the sweater in a complete tube, and then you cut the armholes open. She published her first pattern for this system back in 1958 in her second newsletter. So you can find the newsletters that she produced, many of them from 1958 to 1968 can be found in the Opinionated Knitter. So you can see what her original concept was. 
And then when she published her first book, which is Knitting Without Tears, she again talked about this ski sweater, but she had more information, more tips, things like that for, for how to approach it and how to customize it if you want to do a cardigan or if you wanted a different type of neckline than what the original was. The original was just a boat neck. Like you just knit a tube, cut holes for the armholes, and then sewed a third of the way up for each side and then you had your sweater and I didn't really want that. So I'm grateful for the refinements that she has in here. So a few months ago when I was thinking about this sweater, uh, one of the things that she does is she, she supplies some charts for the stitch patterns in this book, but she also says you can use whatever you uh, want if you, if you have some other stitch patterns that you want to use. So I have many, many books in my, in my library uh, up, up here on stranded color work and they contain a lot of traditional stitch patterns from various uh, knitting traditions. But I was wondering what would have been available in the 1970s. So rather than using something published in the 80s or 90s as a source for stitch patterns, I wanted 1970s sources. And I asked all of you guys a few months ago for ideas and I got quite a few and I did uh, purchase a few used books that have stitch patterns in them. One of them is this um, Montricot book that a lot of people mentioned. Um, then there was this one by Sarah Dawn. This was published in 1979 so it just makes it. It's called A, a Practical Handbook of Traditional Designs Fair Isle Knitting. Uh, and what was interesting to me about this book um, as well as uh, this one right here is that the example patterns that they had in these books which were published here in the US was that the sweaters were all knit flat and then seamed up um, or if they were knit in the round the they split for the armholes and knit back and forth neither one of those books from the 1970s mentions this very traditional concept of steaking and it was interesting to, to read in Elizabeth's writings her discovery of this. She happened to have a Norwegian sweater that she owned and she was thinking about knitting a sweater like this and she started noticing that there were a lot of ends on the inside. They were like, what was going on here? And, and that was when she realized, oh, this was just knit in a tube and it was cut. And so she sort of figuring out that process of how to handle the yarns um, as you were knitting with two colors and she was doing it the way that was always recommended in books back then which is to drop one yarn and then pick the other one up underneath it so that you were twisting them together. That was certainly the recommendation in books that I found in the 80s even when I learned to knit. Uh, and it's needed for intarsia, which is color block knitting. Um, and she, she realized, oh, well, if I drop the yarn and pick it up this other way so that I don't twist it, that's better. And then she, re she remembered, oh, well, when I was a child, I learned, she was English. She learned the English style of, of knitting, but she, I think she had a nanny or, or she was in Germany or something that she learned the continental method. And so she's like, oh, I could use my English method to handle one of the yarns and the continental or German method to uh, handle the other yarn. And so she figured that out on her own. So uh, without, just by observing what was going on in the sweater. So she's, she's kind of a woman after my own heart in terms of empowering knitters to really understand what's going on in their, in their knitting. And so I appreciate that sort of model. And that was one of the reasons that I wanted to use something of hers for my 1970s sweater because she continues to influence uh, knitters today and with, with the ideas and innovations, uh, many of which people considered old fashioned. Um, when she, it, which were, they were, they were traditional, but they were good techniques. I'm currently uh, trying to decide what sort of yarn. I was looking to see what her original recommendations were and trying to see if I could come up with a yarn that was uh, similar to what she recommends. So her company, uh, Schoolhouse Press, her daughter still runs it today. And I noticed that one of the yarns that they recommended was an Icelandic uh, 
uh, I always call it Pluto Lopi, but it's Pluto Lupi or Pluto Lopi. It's essentially uh, an unspun Icelandic wool and it comes in these little wheels. So I bought some of this a couple of years ago when I was doing a series of Technique Tuesday videos on yarn constructions. And so I bought these and I've actually been keeping them in a cubby very close to my desk so that I could see them all the time because I wanted to come up with something to knit them with. I'm terrible at figuring out a project by looking at yarn. I usually go in the other direction. So this is one of the options and, and they, re they recommend holding two strands of it together and so you'd be knitting like with a, as a bulky weight. So that's one of my options. And on Schoolhouse Press um, website today, they, another yarn that they were recommending was one from Bartlett Yarns. So Bartlett Yarns is a mill on the East Coast. It has a, what's called a spinning mule, which was a way, a 19th century um, machine for spinning what's called woolen spun yarn. And again, when I did that series on yarn constructions a couple of years ago, I had bought some yarn from them. And I had bought two colors at the time, and I was uh, doing a little bit of swatching. So the yarn that they were recommending on Schoolhouse Press is actually a three-ply yarn from Bartlett's that's thicker, it's a bulkier weight. Um, but the way that Elizabeth's percentage system works is you're going based on your own gauge and the measurements you want. So you're establishing your own stitch count. I looked at the three-ply yarn that Bartlett Yarns has and they have a certain number of colors, but they didn't have enough that contrasted with each other that I felt I could use for a strand of color work sweater. So this is their two ply version. It's more of a worsted weight to Aran weight. And um, I, they have a lot more colors. And so I have some of that yarn here that I, just these two balls that I can experiment with. So I will be able to do some swatching using two possibilities. The yarns are very different from each other and will work up at different uh, gauges. And so that will help me decide. So the other thing I need to decide is do I want a dark background with light colored stitches? Cause I'm only gonna use two colors. I'm not gonna introduce a bunch of other colors. Um, or so dark background with light stitches or light background with dark stitches. I'm leaning toward a dark background with light stitches just because I tend to like dark colored sweaters more. Uh, and I am thinking uh, about doing a cardigan. So I not only will be sticking the armholes, I'll be sticking the front. So I've taken a sticking class before. I've never knit a project that called for them. So that will be part of the, the learning process and the fun process for me for my 1970s sweater. So uh, that's what I'm working on right now in my head. Things are, I'm looking, uh, planning what I want to do and what yarns I'm going to use and, and beginning the swatching process very soon. Well, that's it for this week's Casual Friday. If you have any comments or questions about today's video or suggestions for videos you'd like to see in the future, you can leave those down in the comments below or join the discussion in my Ravelry group, Rocks Rocks. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.